So what we do at Rocket Scooter is a completely different type of analysis. We pioneered this entire field. It's called positional risk analysis. And what we do is we, in a simplest explanation possible, is we look in the options market and we actually have an algorithm that can extract information from that to give an analysis of where institutional and market maker positions are. We don't count every option like it's meaningful. We have a specific way we look inside of the flow to find these things. You might've heard the word flow lately. It's a very popular hot topic in the uh, trading vendor and technology marketplace. It's, it's great. Flow shows you where unusual activity is and can alert you when things are happening in the market that's not the easiest uh, thing for technical analysis or fundamentals to see. Now, flow being all the rage, everyone looks at it. We are now the one up to flow. Flow shows you unusual activity as it's happening. Rocket Scooter is the tool that will predict volume before it happens from the start of the day the flow will go ding 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 ding. there's flow there's things unusual and we're like well at 9 30 we told you the levels where unusual activity will take place every single time it is never never wrong at predicting volume the one thing the stock market can't be predicted is price action and where you go. Everything else, everything else in pricing is random. Supply and demand is random. What humans do is random. But where machines behave, where unusual volume comes in to, uh, to hedge positions, for instance, or to, to exercise a, uh, an option or on an assignment, those things are mechanical and they happen the same way every time. So it makes this a repeatable thing that can just show you on a chart where some volume hotspots will be at the start of the day. And so in that technique, what we can do, and just on the surface, is that anything that has options, you don't have to know anything about options, by the way. This is all done on the back end. So you trade SPY, you trade S&P futures, or you trade oil, or you trade Tesla stock, or you a swing trader, investor. Anybody can benefit from this type of analysis because it shows you where Wall Street is positioned, right? So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're bullish or you're bearish. Um, you guys can see my screen, correct? The spy chart. Just making sure. I like to start off all the time by sharing that I'm actually really a trader. Um, here's my PL for today. Just to show you, I really do trade using Rock Seer Tools. This is today's profit, 2,800 bucks. I'm doing it, currently doing a 10K to 100K challenge. Um, about two thirds of the way there, so that's great. And inching along, you know, 3K today is a great, a great run on that. And somebody asked, "Am I using the same data as Flow or not?" It's not clear. I'm using so I'm using data straight from the source, Opera, the Options Reporting Authority. They are the only provider of options data to the entire United States market. Okay, so the people that use flow or unusual activity get data likely from Opera as well. We get our data straight from the source the same way. Uh, any unusual flow type uh, analysis, this is what it does. It knows like an average of what it's looking for. And anytime the order flow on a period of time comes in above the average, they just mark it as unusual. It's not really that sophisticated. I can go code unusual activity in probably about an hour or two worth of time. You literally have a baseline. And if it comes in above that, it's unusual. There's nothing bad or good. I mean, nothing great about it. But there's, it's not a terrible thing either. It alerts you that something weird is happening and you need to come in. It's a great tool to use. Unfortunately, flow doesn't necessarily indicate are somebody buying or selling, right? You have to be a little bit more... Um, informed on how to analyze that in real time is that people selling to the bid is that people shorting to get into a short people selling to get out of an of a, of a long position which one is it right you, you wouldn't know until you have to dive in a little deeper and it's kind of requires a lot of analysis on the fly so once you get that ding ding ding, ding unusual stuff you got to start really digging in and okay uh is this up is this down is this break out and within the, at the end of the day you're you're forced to be an expert on the fly really quickly like an astronaut like like the shit happens in space you're automatically having to like be an expert at your tools it's not really intuitive for a new user right so knowing where the hot spots will be uh just as an icebreaker hedge pressure you hear that word all the time anytime you touch hedge pressure is a guaranteed volume spike you see this right here 
And at 9.30 in the morning, we've printed that and it's there all day. Anytime you interact with head pressure, where my mouse is right here, this volume was higher than the opening volume. That's what we do. So as the flow machines are like, ding, 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 there's flow, ding, 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 there's flow. We're like, well, yeah, we, we anticipated flow to be there. Unusual flow, right? And every line that Rock Scooter shows you is going to be unusual flow because of certain things that have to happen there. There's no technical analysis. Believe it or not, these tools don't even know what the price of the candle is. That's how far detached we are from traditional tr traditional analysis. Hedge pressure, monthly hedge pressure, walls don't even know what the price of the stock is. Isn't that great? It's not looking at the history of the price, the shape of the price, the flag, the candlesticks, nothing. We get everything from the risk in the options market. If I bought 418 calls in SPY that expire today and SPY's in the money, the person that sold me those calls will have to buy 100 shares per call if they didn't have anything to ward off the risk of assignment. To me, if I exercise those calls, it forces them to buy if the call sellers' calls go in the money. If they don't buy, they're stupid because they're going to have to buy at an even higher price by being punished. So there's robotic trading that goes in and longs and shorts the market to offset the risk of options that are sold to people. You go out there and buy an option. The person that sold that option to you is out there buying and shorting the shares of the stock of that option to make sure they're always balanced and neutral. Because that's what a market maker is doing. They're just getting paid to trade. They don't want to take a long or short position if they don't have to. They're going to neutralize on the other side. Do we all understand that philosophy? Because that's what we exploit here. So far, so good. Everyone, yes in chat? Again, somebody, somebody said flow itself doesn't provide you with the direction where price will go. No. So imagine you have to go in there and, and try to analyze and make an assessment on where price will go. It's really hard to do. So imagine knowing where flow will be before it happens or a better way to say it is what we actually can show you is every single line that you'll see on this chart, bull zone, bear zone, open, close, half gaps, hedge pressures, all that is a high volume node in the works before it happens. So if you think about what I just said, if any of you ever traded on a volume profile before, right? Volume profile shows you where volume has accumulated at different prices in the past. But imagine at the start of the day, knowing where volume hotspots will be, so that tomorrow's volume profile is going to have a high volume node here. So with Rocket Scooter in, a, in an elevator pitch, one of the major things is that you might have started the day looking at yesterday's volume profile, wherever it was. But we're trading with tomorrow's volume profile before it's even been made. Don't look at yesterday's volume support and resistance. Look at tomorrow's volume support and resistance because we know where that volume is going to be. So we can, we're constructing a volume profile a day in advance. Imagine that. Imagine the power there already on the surface. Use VWAPs or volume-related instrument type uh, indicators. You will be utilizing past volume or, or current volume as it's happening, not forecasting future volume. If you load up a volume profile tomorrow, you will see high volume node here. I mean, it's very clear to see there's opening volume. There's half gap volume spike at the bottom of the box. There's a volume spike at half gap here and hedge pressure touch, hedge pressure touch. The highest volume candles of the day are here and here on this one minute chart. Look at this, right? And there's other, there's other volume interactions that come up. Some of our other techniques like yellow lines and DD bands, which are these other spikes. But what you can see is that you can see volume unusual activity that comes way above the average just because of this one little candle right here. You'll see that? Okay, so the idea is what does Rocket Scooter do? If we, we look through the entire options market and we filter out the majority of it, the majority of the options market is noise, believe it or not. Your 600 Tesla YOLO calls, nobody cares about, right? You bought something way out of the money, nobody cares about. Your options pretty much meaningless. We care about the options that are meaningful. And the way we determine that is our secret sauce here. Um, you know, we are a team of engineers that love to data mine. And we found some very, very interesting consistencies in the options market, hedging and market makers. And we piece it together and created this tool set. So the average retail trader can now see where major banks and institutions are positioned and where market makers are hedging to give yourself another layer of the market to go on top of anything else you do. Technicals, fundamentals, whatever. How many people here, just as a little last little icebreaker before I get to training, um, have, have thought that, it, that because we're in a recession, it's gonna be a bear market, it's gonna be a nasty bear market. 
like since last year, we fell to October, uh, the market pivoted around and all year this year, you probably don't trust the rally. You probably think that, uh, I don't know, it's got to come down. Fundamentals are bearish. Technicals are bearish, 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 right? And so just as an icebreaker, um, on October the 17th, I called a bottom using a rocket scooter. And I said, there's a rally through mid-January, genuine buying, bear market gets nasty again in the summer, which is coming up in two months or three months, right? Quarter two for summer lower lows. I've since revised my thought here that it's probably be the end of the summer. But imagine in October, I built a bull market thesis and posted this really long thing. And there's a lot of people that were like, okay, that's silly. That makes zero sense in the world. The fundamentals are bare. Stocks are trading over earnings, this and that. Quantitative fighting, Fed's raising rates. And October the 17th is exactly where my mouse is. Let me just draw a circle there. L let me explain something to you guys. I've been trading since 2010. I don't call a lot of things. I don't point to the bleachers like Babe Ruth unless I know I'm right. Imagine calling a bottom right there. I'm going to tell you how I did it. And I'm going to tell you the tools that I use. And again, I, I bookmarked it because I don't really tweet bottoms a lot. Imagine this day right here. And I go, that is the bottom of the stock market for like the next nine months. And everybody on spaces would argue with me and thought, I don't know what I'm talking about. It doesn't mean I'm not a bear. It doesn't mean I don't believe in the recession. It means I know how markets move and when they get there and how long it's going to take to get there. The market's still bullish for the next two or three months. Here's what it's likely going to look like further. We're likely to break out, likely to see some resistance and maybe slow crawl. And honestly, I'm, I'm in the 4,600 camp Maybe not that soon, but it's actually going to rally a little faster. I'm in this camp right here. And that around end of August, we're back to selling again. I can figure that out using Rocket Scooter because that's where people's positions are telling me they're going. I have all kinds of tools at my disposal to try to look for these things. And I'm just looking at where Wall Street's positions are to try to figure this out. Now, one of the easiest ways we do this is using something called a monthly map. Somebody type in your favorite stock. What I love about the presentations as well, or I hate about them, is usually people come in pre-prepared with like their best example of a stock, right? But see, us being the real deal here, I let you guys throw me the weirdest curve volleyest stock you can think of, and I'll do it on the fly. I will run one of these on the fly and paint a picture for you. Anybody have a stock? Especially somebody that's new here. Can I do futures? So yeah, we do ev we do everything. Okay, uh, DraftKings, Neo. I haven't looked at DraftKings in a while. Let's let's pick that one. You guys do a bunch of that here. Okay. All right. So let me run this really quick. All right. So two things happen whenever you type in a ticker. Number one is you get all of these things that show on the screen. We'll show up, this is what we call our liquidity map. What the liquidity map does is it will show you where all of the risk is in the market. It looks like my browser is freezing a little bit. Uh, all the risk is in the market in one spot, like, like an at a glance. So let me, let me go ahead and refresh this. I think actually, let me, give me one second. Let me reopen this. I think my browser, there we go. Let's try this one more time. Okay. You guys with me? Okay. Um, DraftKings, right? So at a glance, you can see where the bull zone and bear zone is. And the lack of better words, this is telling you where all the risk in this stock is. Right now, we are trading in the bull zone. This is very bullish. There are calls that are in the money. There are people that sold calls forced to buy. That's what bull zone means. This is bear zone. It's the opposite. People are forced to short. So you have bull zone and bear zone. You have a hedge pressure, which is which is the market maker of options, the gamma balance of all sold options to market makers from another market maker. Sounds complicated, but trust me on this hedge pressure, just like I showed high volume pivot on the interaction, just like SPY was earlier, right? You have hedge pressure built off of weeklies, and then you have 
hedge pressure built off of monthlies and they give you an overall view of the market. So this entire package right here called liquidity map tells me so much about DraftKings. We opened today in the bull zone. We opened with a little bit of negative gamma hedging. So you have bullish support, hedge pressure resistance. Breaking through to the other side of a hedge pressure is a recipe for disaster. If I were shorting this, I'm not short on the other side of that because this is what's called a gamma squeeze. You have your gamma squeeze starts here level. Right? This is the start of the race. You see how the market gets very chaotic right here at hedge pressure? Because this is where the market maker fight takes place. Look at how much volume comes in on this fight. People got squeezed and were forced to buy. Do we all see that? This is clear as day hedge pressure break. This is my mechanism for longing the spy today did the same thing. Once we were on this side of hedge pressure supported, I jumped in all along. I didn't long down here because it's likely sandwiched. I'm waiting for a definitive break. So this is an idea of just seeing what you can see on a day trade for DraftKings. Now, monthly map is a way to look at what DraftKings looks like a month from now. And so one of the things is that we can see bull zones and bear zones split on each one of these expiration dates. Rocket Scooter is going to show you exactly how people feel about DraftKings. Now, just without going through a class on monthly maps, it's the relative shape of the top of the bear zone and the bottom of the bull zone that matters. If the bulls are willing to buy higher, that's a bull side weakening. That's people getting out of longs. If the bear side is shorting higher, that's the bear side strengthening. So in DraftKings right now, it's consolidating. While we do have a breakout today, I'm more willing to short the high because the bear side is getting stronger this week and the bull side is getting weaker. That hedge pressure break is, is, is a nice run today, but I'm not bullish the long term because the monthly map points the other direction. So now I can kind of see no matter what kind of analysis you do. And notice how I'm not like zooming out, like where's the highs and lows and where are we trading? DraftKings to me in this example, and now I finally look at the past and go, oh yeah, that has been selling off pretty hard. But as you see, this doesn't even look at candle data. I'm just kind of like where, where I am here. And if I were to paint a picture, is that DraftKings is still back to consolidating and likely finding lows before highs. Because the bull side is getting weaker for the next two weeks. It's not getting stronger. Let me show you a stock that's getting stronger. Somebody said Tesla, right? So on the other side of the coin, let's look at Tesla today. Notice the opposite, bull side getting stronger, bear side getting weaker. Tesla is going to likely squeeze higher before it goes lower. The idea that bears are deter they're just so there are no bears right here where I'm circling in this triangle shape. Bears are just fleeing the scene of the crime. Do you all see the steepness of the top of this bear zone here? That's just telling you that where puts are, they're expiring and there's, there's, there's not going to be the same amount of puts at those same levels as the weeks go by. So as you see, Tesla's more likely to go higher than lower on two factors. Number one, bears are squeezing and, and actually genuine buying as well. So when I look at Tesla on the intraday by clicking just daily modes, so I just click these modes and thumb between them. As you see, Tesla, just like DraftKings, has an interaction with hedge pressure um, as you play with it. Um, the breakthrough and support creates relative volume spikes, not highest volume of the day, but relative volume spike. And then Tesla, again, breaks out on a hedge pressure break. These levels are key to any trader's diet, whether you're swing trading or day trading or trying to set a stop or trying to understand sentiment. Today, as an example, I wouldn't be shorting Tesla at all. Is that the default setting? Yes, the default setting is daily mode. When you load up, it'll load up just like this. Let me type in another thing. So somebody says ES for futures. See, the trick to how liquidity map works is we use equity options. So if you're going to trade ES futures, you will use SPY and you will stare at ES chart and they will pivot at the same exact spot. The trick is to utilize SPY to trade your futures. I only trade futures, by the way, on these streams that I do. So an example is NASDAQ futures will use QQQ, oil futures will use USO, et cetera. Any really good ETF or ETN will give you a liquidity map. We don't make them in futures. 
because futures hedging can take place outside the futures market. An example is if you buy USO, it's the circling back on oil futures. If you buy oil futures, you may hedge that by buying barrels of oil. And that volume isn't seen on the chart. Because of that, liquidity maps off of futures products aren't weak. But even so, the ones in equities products are so strong, they actually call the shots. The hedging and SPY yanks futures around more than futures does anything to the stock market. I'll tell you that for sure. Hedge pressure being proof of that. So, um, so far, so good on questions. So we have three different major tools that we use that people use on the day-to-day -day basis to do whatever they want. So as an example, um, you can see that the index has direction because of a monthly map. And then today I can say where I want to enter and exit on a day trade or a swing trade or whatever. We got three major tools, DD, resilience and liquidity map that help me understand direction of the market. This is a bull bear bias indicator. This is very bullish today. This is a gap fill predictor, very much predicting the gap fill today to the upside. And then BLU is all things up. All things are up today. All signs are great. Now that helps me understand how I want to trade or direction I want to take. And then we have a cheat sheet that we give people on how to read liquidity maps. So liquidity map says BLU. BLU is showing me like I have support at a monthly hedge pressure and support at a hedge pressure. There's a little bit of a guide here and then a support at the open. So I have three possible places I'd want to enter on. So bouncing off of blue is a great entry. As a matter of fact, I did nothing until on the stream. I longed right here with the stop right there. And I took the trade on bouncing off of blue because liquidity map shows me there's a net positive gamma there on sold options and market makers that forces people to long the stock. Okay, so in general, first thing I do when I wake up is I just wait and then I, I read all my fundamentals in the morning. I read all the reports and get the news for what's going on in the day and look at the calendar, make sure there's no events. Today we had an event, right? We had manufacturing PMI. Um, that came out right at the turn of the hour. And so after the event, the market jolted around a little bit and then now stabilized. It was a non-event because we ended up where we started after the news came out. So essentially the market's not responding to that. Uh, it's working on its own mechanics now. So I'm going to get up here and I'm going to look at, we have three tools that come out. Let me see what I have. So right out the door, I'm going to say, let's just analyze an example for SPY. Let me go ahead and just put this over to the side. And let me, let me zoom in a little bit as well so you guys can see an example of what I would do. So first and foremost, I look at the monthly map every day to try to understand the feel of the market. Like, you know, with that mouth feel, like, is it up or down in general? So let's kind of map this out, right? Spy bull zones kind of look like this. Um, they're choppy, but they're working their way lower. As you see, you have weeks where bull side is just getting stronger. I mean, sorry, stronger. And then a little bit profit taking stronger, profit taking stronger, profit taking stronger, profit taking even stronger. So the S&P on the bull side is going to move up in waves. You can already see that. And the commitment of traders is a report that actually shows you that in S&P futures. You can see this green line is moving up in waves. These are your net buyers of the market. Monthly map is showing you those waves of buyers, even so, and actually projecting them to exist until the end of July. There are genuine buyers until the end of July. They're parking money here because it's better than inflation. Stock market's not crashing. People are starting to long this market. It's weird. And they're in a fundamental bear market. We are in a fundamental recession. There's unemployment going up. There's high inflation, all in quantitative tightening and rate hikes. Yet people are still willing to buy. All those things I just said point to a doomsday scenario where the market should collapse under its own weight. Everybody screamed doom and gloom at the end of October. And we saw this pattern. There are buyers stepping in. I tweeted that. They're buying cautiously. It's not like the S&P looks like Tesla where they're just diving into this thing. You can see that people are rotating into things and rotating out of things being very picky. But in general, you know, getting into some longs, getting out before something, getting into longs, getting out for GDP, getting in the longs, getting out before Fed, you know, things like that. And you can see the bear side I'm going to draw in red on the longer term is very much rapidly deteriorating. It's not as wavy, but you can see that bears are just going away and bulls are kind of stepping in. And then somewhere in here, what do y'all notice? I'm going to ask just a general question. 
right here. What do you notice that's different with what I'm circling or after the square? What do you notice here that's different than there? Let's just see on the surface if you learned something in the last 10 minutes. Bears going up. Yeah, people are, are hunkering down, right? You know, digging their fingers in there, becoming more bearish. Volatility, yeah, so there's some volatility there. And bulls, bull side weakening, bear side strengthening. You see an inflection point right here in the S&P. People are willing to have a little bit more choppy bullishness all summer, and then we're going to start tailoring or start tapering off and selling off around August. That's what positions are telling me. It's June the 1st. This is, that's three months away. Do you see how if I'm timing swing trades or options on the bull side, I've got a limited window that I need to operate in for the bull side. You see how, how valuable that information is? When I'm making choices as a trader, I'm not swinging for the fence like, oh, it's just going to go up forever. I have clear as day visibility right now that it's likely got a choppy run up for about three months. I need to be careful when I enter so I don't lose theta decay. I don't lose on theta decay. I need to be careful of how far out my expiration is so I can get there in time. If I wanted to swing this long three months from now, it's telling me people are still bullish in the next quarter's earnings. So next quarter's earnings are expected to be good, or at least to beat off of expectations because people are still willing to buy over the next three months. So not only am I forecasting better signs despite all the bearish stuff, I can forecast that the Fed's not going to raise rates any further because people would be showing their evidence of that there. Both the bulls and bear side would be showing their fears of Fed, in which you do usually see that as, um, you know, I think the Fed meeting is, is right in here. You see bulls taking profit. And bears taking profit leading into Fed. Nice little volatile point right there is likely a Fed week. Okay. So in all honesty, it's showing you for further bearish. Just let me show you something even cool or for further bullishness. QQQ. This is the S this is the NASDAQ. And you can see that while it has that same choppiness, it's still got once you weather through that July thing, look at look at NASDAQ, it gets even more bullish and bears flee. It's different. It doesn't have that uh, inflection point here, which is telling you that tech is likely to lead the rally. Even further, NASDAQ doesn't have that inflection point where the bears start to grow. You see a lot of choppiness going through a lot of big data points we're going to have. But in general, you just see that bullishness continue to support and that bearishness continue to flee with no reversal point. So if I were to say what causes the market to lead, NASDAQ is going to double top this market. And now you have the idea that tech is going to, and it's looked like this all year. That's why back in October, November, December, I'm tweeting tech's going to lead the rally because you can see NASDAQ has, bears can't get away fast enough and they're not getting, they're not coming in stronger. The larger the gap, the larger the volatility, 100%. So one of the things Monthly Maps is great at is forecasting volatility before it happens. A great way to see that is, um, let me see if I can kind of narrow this down. Right, not so much of a volatile week here. More volatile, very volatile, not so volatile. So what's happening June the sixth? Uh, let's just this is just like Monday, Wednesday. What's happening June the sixth, June the ninth? Do we have anything coming out in the next couple of days? Or, sorry, the next week, painting some volatility. You can go to our calendar and see um, what's going on next week. Anything big could be some, you have ISM, non-manufacturing. These are huge data points. Um, services, PMI, huge data point. Jobless claims, always a big data point. Let's go to the week after. Um, let's pick the... I'm trying to see if we have anything big. Up oh, CPI immediately that following Tuesday. Uh, and Wednesday's a Fed day. I mean, June the 14th, 13th. All the way up to the 14th is going to be fed volatility you see that you get cpis pmis fed that's where that volatility is bulls are taking profits bears are taking profits you see how that works gamer you asked so this even forecast wait something's going on in here i need to double check the calendar calendar shows me oh yeah fed is right there there's there's, there's a reason for volatility and as a matter of fact the neat takeaway from this is this is the expected move of the week 
or the period between bars. So an example is if it's like a Friday expiring option, it's the period between Fridays, for instance, with the stock. This is the expected move today, really small, uh, or sorry, for the week. Um, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So you can understand that the market's likely to trickle up. And then once we get to the Fed week, you're going to get a lot more volatility. So the ranges get bigger. So if you're selling options, this is this distance is telling you about how far out to sell. It's it's a cool trick. Ashton kind of came up with that one. Uh, so in a ticker, Microsoft thing we were looking at that earlier. And if you were to come in with like a um, an idea that if you were to take this distance right here, do you see how like every day is like basically that distance? It's pretty cool how that works. You're not going to see a lot of volatility. And then this week, this is the expected weekly um, move, I means the worst day of the week could be that big. So you can see that very much going into Fed, pretty much every dip is likely to get bought up and it's going to be pretty big. And Microsoft's going to top off there if this stays the same. So you see how I'm looking into the future. I'm not looking at the past. I'm not doing support, resistance, all these different things people do. This is a layer of looking at options positions in the future and giving you that idea. As you see, Microsoft has that same look of all the other tech is that bulls can't jump in low enough. I mean, bulls are running to jump in on this thing and bears can't flee fast enough. And then there's an inflection point here where it's going to top off. So if I were to make a guess, Microsoft's gap up is going to hold through Fed. Any dip is likely going to get bought up. We're going to go to highs and then probably start selling off there. So now if I were to zoom in and say, okay, my thoughts are Microsoft's got some dips to buy, not so volatile this week. I might get a smaller, a bigger dip next week. Where do I want to trade this? Let me go in today. Ah, Microsoft bull long up. Okay. So I, I got the feel of the market. Yeah. Bearish mechanics, feds in the way, the tech's leading the way because QQQs look great. And Microsoft looks like it's got a couple weeks of rally. It shows me that. Um, so let me pull up my liquidity map, little cheat sheet and say, what does a bull long up look like? So the market opens at 930. I get my stuff. I come in here and say, ah, bull long up has some pivots. There is a pivot off of yellow, which is off the screen. So let's ignore that one. There's a possible open. If we support at the open, it's going to rally. If we resist the open, it bounces off of blue and goes back to open. Okay. So I'm going to use these tools to my advantage and the open and close price are marked there for convenience. So I literally draw on my screen every day what I think is going to happen and then I just trade around it. So as you see, the open price is a black dot in the guide. Here's the open price. If you resist the open and it falls, then hedge pressures is support back to open. So I'm going to draw a line just like it shows support back to open. So that's a potential scalp I can take. The other side of the BLU. So I take these three letters and I just find them on here. This also says if you support at the open when all things are pointing up, then it's likely to rally higher. So I'm going to draw a another line. If we support, it's likely to rally higher to the next resistance, which I just bump into a line and, and call it quits. So there's two potential scalps from here to there and there to there. And today you can see how it kind of played out. And that one played out twice. Um, now we filled the gap, we're continuing to go. That's a whole nother mechanic. But do you see that no matter what Microsoft did, my longer term stance is that we're bullish for two weeks. My shorter term stance is, all right, I need a dip to buy. So I could long from here. I can double down there and put a stop right there. I've got swing support. I've got day support. And that's it. I don't change the time frame. I never change that. I don't change... I don't look at the candles. I don't even look at yesterday's price. I don't even know what Microsoft did yesterday. Don't even care. This is where people are positioned now, and that's what I care about. Who cares what they did yesterday? I care about what they did this morning, where we closed yesterday, where we opened this morning. You see what I'm saying? So the idea is that I'm not relying on the past information to try to pivot the market in the future. Now, there's other things we do utilize, like gap fills and things like that are very important. I'm not going on this lesson. This is just to show you where pressures will come from, from hedging and from positional risk. So far, so good. So I have a, a bullishness over some time. I've got bull support here, bull support there. And now I can say, okay, I want along Microsoft today. 
how these other tools work. Let me show you something cool. Um, so DD in a nutshell is a tool that will tell you, okay, so what bull and bear zones are very, very quickly. A bull zone is where our algorithm is identified. Somebody has longed the stock or the shares of this thing against a market maker who's bought options on the other side. So if market makers shorted to a buyer and bought calls to hedge their short, we look for relationships like that. And so these are pockets of market maker options calls. These are pockets of market maker puts. So bull zone and bear zone just generally have a pressure that's bullish or bearish. If calls are in the money, well, people are forced along the shares. It's, it's a very simple concept. And if the S&P is trading to its bear zone and the S&P is supposed to track what the stocks are doing, DD is actually telling me what the stocks are doing. 74% of the market cap of illiquid stocks in the index are trading in their own bull zones. This is a trick. S&P falls to the bear zone. How many people in Rocket Scooter today longed from this bear zone just to snap it back to bull zone? I didn't take that trade, but I know someone else did. Exilio took it. Bonnie Tech took it. Louie took it. Because when the S&P is tethered to the stocks and the S&P is trying to trade to its own bear zone and diverge from what the stock market's doing, anytime DD is greater than 0.5, it's bullish. 74% of the market cap is trading in its own bull zone, meaning 74% of the market cap is, is likely hedging higher and pushing higher. Why would SPY move to its bear zone if the stocks are moving up? It's going to snap back into place more often than it doesn't. So DD is a lie detector of like bad moves in the SPY. If SPY opens in the bull zone and this DD stays bullish, it's likely to close in the bull zone by the end of the day. So any dip to the bear zone, people long it back up to snap back in place. So this is an arbitrage indication that, that shows if the index has moved away from the stocks. They're going to meet somewhere at some point, maybe in the middle, or maybe both go up, or maybe both go down. The idea that this was bullish that's bullish, it's likely to take the bet that the depressed SPY snaps back into place with the stocks. Okay, so it's an aggregate of what all the sum of the market cap in that index is doing. And it's one of the most powerful tools here. DD is a bias indicator. Can I tell you a cool trick? Since October of last year, DD has been less than 0.5 only two times in this entire year. Another reason we've been rallying, individual stocks are bullish in that crazy. So wake up every day, eh, bull market continues. My two-week outlook is bullish. My that Microsoft example, yeah, I got a dip to buy. And man, every day, all the rest of the stocks, more bulls and bears, more bulls and bears. So every dip is getting bought and every dip is likely to continue to get bought until this number starts to deteriorate less than half. Believe me, the year before in the bear market, DD was 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.1. It got bad. But every day we wake up and it's still bullish. And guess what we see in the market? Still bullish. Notice how you're not putting like eight different charts on top of each other. No multi time frame confluence, none of that stuff. None of the stuff that you pulled out from a, a trading YouTube or trading textbook from like 60 years ago is not being helpful to the analysis. It's simple principles. The SPY tracks the SPX which tracks the sum of the stocks. If stocks go up and SPY goes down, they're going to meet somewhere in the middle, aren't they? They're going to chase each other at some point. This is going to lead me to the bull, the bull case. Okay, questions. If DD is above half, touching bear zone, but resilience is negative, how do we approach it? Very simple. DD outranks resilience. We have a ranking system for the big three. DD, resilience, liquidity map are ranked like this. Whatever you want to do here is overridden if this creates a problem, is overridden if this creates a problem. So ultimately, if resilience was negative and you pull down to here and DD is bullish, you would likely make a choice to say, well, the spy is likely to chase and go back up, which can rescue resilience, which it did. So I don't, resilience can scare me out of a trade if it can cause a hedge pressure break, which it did. That's why I didn't take the trade here. I only longed 
once we got on the other side of it. But some of the more maverick traders here used the priority and took the trade from here to there. It's discretional at that point if you want to be over trading or not. But it is a good probability that if you open in the bull side and fall to bear side that you're likely to snap back in more often than not. So you are correct. Uh, the liquidity map today was bullish. Resilience at the start of the morning was, was bearish. And then DD was bullish. So I'm waiting all day for resilience to look better. And then I took my long. The minute we snapped above here and fell right here, um, you come down here. We'll talk about resilience. Resilience positive again. So I was like, all things point up. I'm going to take the long. And once all things pointed up, it went way up, right? So it even helps with my patience, not getting in over trading. While this was a great trade to take, I would have only put a small position on it because I, I wasn't too certain, but I was pretty, pretty certain. Here I put in a pretty long trade. I get made three grand today. So it's a pretty decent run up. Now, resilience is the same thing. It's an aggregate, but it exploits another principle called the redistribution zone. The open and closed price of a stock from one day to the next is always high volume. You see high volume candle where my mouse is right here. Market makers have to hold an imbalance between the close and the open. They have a closing imbalance and an opening imbalance. The net imbalance of those two, which means at the end of the day, if there's more buyers and sellers on those, on those closing MOC or MO orders, which is like the order of the market maker, they're going to hold like hundreds of thousands of shares one way or the other, long or short. So redistribution zone is for them to get out of that position and get back to neutral. So if everybody's selling at the end of last yesterday, there's 500,000 share imbalance. So the market maker had to buy from those sellers. They're now long 500,000 shares going into the morning. They got to kind of get out of that long somehow. So inside of here, they're trying to find sellers to get out of that long. So in the redistribution zone is essentially a fancy word for how we exploit gaps. We open higher than we close. So in this case, the SPY traded right here. And then we gapped up. So this is a gap up, right? Gap up. So when you gap up on SPY, we know that the open and close price are always going to be high volume pivots. Every time you touch the open and close, this is traditional trading techniques as well. Anytime you fill a gap, there's always a pivot, right? If you all, every time you fill a gap, there's always high volume. Anytime you touch the open of the day or the close of the previous day, there's always high volume. This is any stock. This is anything. This is like technical analysis 101. Gaps are the most important pivots on the chart to begin with. Anytime you, you press through, uh, open, close, you're going to have volume interaction like this candle right here is trading through the open and then trading to the close, right? Anytime you touch open and close, that's the market makers redistributing that imbalance back to the market. So the, the question is the same as DD. If market makers are raising price, they're looking for sellers. Well, you know, there's sellers and buyers at the open and close. That's what created the gap to begin with. So you know that they're going to be looking for the open and closes pivots. And the same thing applies to all the stocks. Every stock is going to have a redistribution zone. You guys are rock skater experts and like this one hour sesh. Apple pivoting open and close. Uh, pick, a, pick, a, pick a stock, Microsoft we did earlier, pivoting open and close, right? Uh, D, pivoting off of the close. And somebody said some other stock. JP Morgan, and pivoting open and close. Volume in each place. Any stock has action at its open and close, ABBB, if it touches it. ABBB resisted the open, gap down, traded down. Shopify, and just some things y'all talk in chat. Pivoting, open and close. There's high volume pivot there. There's high volume pivot there. You can see that you have redistribution taking place in proximity of the edges. There's a volume spike at that tap. There's a volume spike at that break. There's a volume spike off of that support. You believe me now, everybody? Open and close is high volume anytime you interact with it. And that is market makers redistributing that imbalance back to us, trying to go back to neutral. We push them into a short, they try to go back to neutral. We push them along, they try to sell back to neutral. So if the stocks are also trading inside of their zone, if the stock is rallying to look for a seller, what resilience does is it anticipates a move like this is supposed to fill its gap. So with that mentality, we can actually estimate what the actual index value should be if all stocks were to simultaneously fill their gap. So an example is if, if, shop, if something that's trading right here 
the algorithm will say, ah, it needs to fill its gap and look for sellers. We're raising price. It needs to move this much to look for sellers. And there's another stock maybe, maybe trading right here. And the algorithm will go, well, that stock actually needs a lower price to look for buyers. And so when you sum up all, you know, 500 stocks or 505 tickers of the S&P and weigh it by market cap, you get the actual implied value of the S&P that it needs to be if all the stocks are simultaneously lose their imbalances in a snap of a finger. So if the SPY is trading down here and it should be trading right here because of the net sum of all stocks filling their gaps, then arbitrage exists. SPY, again, needs to snap back up and will likely move to fill its gap as well if the rest of the stocks are doing the same. And resilience is an exploit of that. So what it tells you is that inside of this box, resilience is just a tiebreaker. If you're trading in the middle, let me make it really big so you can see it. it's really tight. So we kind of open flat on the S&P. But this is one of the best. This is my favorite tool is resilience, hands down. I use it for so many things. Inside of the box, if resilience is just positive, then stocks are moving to fill their gap to the upside of the box. And so as resilience is trying to fight its way positive, it's not positive yet. It's not finding any steam to get over that edge. It's resisting that box. See that right there? And the minute it starts going positive and supporting and being positive, then you can see that it's trying its darndest to fill the gap this way. Anytime resilience is positive, you draw a line from the middle to the top of the box. It wants to do that. About an inflection point started happening here, and it was fighting for a little bit. And it got really strong right here. So two things happen. Resilience is a tiebreaker from the middle of the box to the top. And it shows support on a gap and go if it's positive and you're outside the box. So once you break out here and start moving, you got, you got the perfect storm for a squeeze. You have hedge pressure break. You have positive resilience. You're outside of the box. You have bullish liquidity map, which is here. All things are pointing up. All those arrows, I just drew all four of them for you. Resilience has a pivot from, from here to here and a pivot from there to there. BLU on the liquidity map has support at the open moves up, support at blue moves up. So one, two, three, four things point up. And then DD states that the S&P is likely to support the bull zone as well for another reason, DD. DD, resilience, liquidity map, all show support right here. So. It shouldn't behoove you why I bought the dip. Like it went like this, and I bought the dip right there. Put a stop there because DD says we're likely to stay in the bull zone and then run. Okay. So how far does the chart predict? Does it change daily? It changes every day. It predicts as far out as there are there are options in this thing. So um, you typically got six weeks of weekly options. So you can be about six weeks in the future accurately. You got monthly options going out year plus every day these change if options close and open today or uh, throughout the day tomorrow it'll be a brand new readout you read it different every day so black line on the legend is the open price and we're we're in the process of actually redesigning the legend to uh, be a little easier to read but this means the open price so 1a is like if the open is support it moves to the next resistance so the open is right here. If the open is support, it's moving to the next resistance, right? That's how I read it. Um, you took it, you guys traded, you guys traded. Um, it, somebody asked, if you wait until it goes above zero rational and buffer of 10 when irrational, it's all about risk management, as Lucas has said, yeah. So what happens if resilience is like trying to shift and it's fighting here? It's not really a clean signal, but you're looking for it to go positive. As he said, risk management is it. I was in the same boat. I was like, ah, it's like trying to get above zero. I want it to go above zero to support my long. Let me go ahead and put a stop right here because at least this outranks that. And this tells me we're likely to be in the bull zone. So I'm good. I'm stopped. And then I'm waiting. Oh, yeah, resilience is great. Nice little pop. Nice little pop. Okay, we're good. Oh, yeah, here. This is going to rally really fast. The minute that happened, I was like, oh, yeah. Right? Easy as that. Okay, explain reading resilience more. 
So resilience, again, is there for just the index, just like DD is for the index as well. This is for the S&P. This is for NASDAQ and the S&P as well. It's a gap filled predictor of the S&P, and there's one in the NASDAQ. It's literally a gap filled predictor. There's two ways to read it. So I just draw lines, and then I, I basically put all the lines together to make a trade plan. So if we were to just turn everything off, except for, let's turn off all the stuff. Let's just leave the redistribution zone on. You can click these buttons and move all the stuff. Okay. You read it just like this. If resilience is positive, it means the majority of the market cap is, is doing this or doing that. If you do that every stock side by side and weighted by market cap, any resilience greater than zero equals the stocks doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's how you do it. You just draw the line. So as you can see, resilience can flip-flop as people are flip-flopping you know, their positions. But once everything lines up, I mean, it's pretty solid. And if it doesn't line up, you just use risk management. Easy as that. So inside the box, resilience is just a pivot from here to there. Res less than zero, res greater than zero. When you're outside the box, this is a break and a run. Also res less than zero. So if you resist that with resilience less than zero, you're not trading above that for the rest of the day. Right? Same thing if you break out of here and resilience is greater than zero, you're trading up. So anything that falls down, I'm likely to take the long to go. I actually took two trades today on that same mentality. Anytime you're outside of this box and resilience is positive, this is your new low of the day by the end of the day. It doesn't go lower than that at all, ever. It's never wrong. It takes a catalyst to kick it the other way because the SPY tracks the sum of the stocks. It tracks the stocks. It, by mechanical design, tracks the stocks. This is tracking the stocks. So the mechanical design of SPY, you notice how we're not using technicals or shapes or anything of that. And I have to go in six minutes, but um, this is an overview of this. We're going to probably do like a masterclass tonight. I'd love for y'all to tune in on this. But basically, if you guys want to play at the software, um, let me give you a link really quick. We're doing this thing where like our highest package, which is that. For 35 a month, you really can't beat it. We want everybody to check it out for three months. That, that link right there will get you guys into the platform. It just basically pays for your data feeds and you get the software for free and the community for free and the training for free. We do this all the time. But basically, the, the mechanics of what Rocket Scooter is doing is it's utilizing mechanical things that are present in the stock market and consistent. Do you all understand what I mean by that? The S&P tracks the sum of the stocks. It's an equation. SPY tracks the S&P loosely. It trades on its own, but eventually they snap into place. So we build indicators off of mechanical things that always happen for repeatability. Resilience, when resilience is positive, and markets are rational, the S&P is likely to rally up to meet the stocks if, they're, if it's greater than zero. So all day long, I basically use these three tools and then a monthly map to understand the market. Putting it all together, monthly map, bullish for two weeks. The S&P liquidity map. Oh, I've got some support here. So let me draw some lines, you know, supporting at bull zone. Uh, sorry, supporting at hedge pressure. Okay, good. If we break through in the open supports, BLU also says we go up. DD, anywhere down in here is a buy opportunity to snap back to there because we're going to end up in the bull zone. And the bull zone is likely to stay support because we opened above it, this DD rule. And then once resilience is positive, we're now pivoting this top of the box. And if we're outside the box, again, resilience supports that being as well. So as you see all this confluence, I can piece it all together and say, there is a really strong push if I add all these up arrows from here to some resistance. I'm just going to put R there. And there's the potential for me to buy some kind of dip down in there on DD. And look what you've got, right? So it's interesting to see that I wake up every day knowing exactly what my risk is. 
where my reward is, where my stop is without ever looking at the price of the thing I'm trading. Isn't that crazy? Because options are the only thing in the world that can predict the future. If I bought an option that expires on Friday for 450 SPY, I just announced I want 100 shares of SPY at 450 on Friday. I'm a bull there. I've told you the future. I've showed you my cards. I own those options. The price is telling you what happened yesterday. It's useless information. Where price is going now, that's important. Where price is relative to the landscape of everything, very important. Yesterday's price, don't even care. Yesterday's volume, don't even care. Today's, today's stuff and looking into the future. So what we did was our technical analysis stops at the past until now to try to project the future. We stop it now. We don't go anywhere in the past and we look at data that expires in the future to make inferences about the future. That's how we get ahead of flow. That's how we get ahead of TA. It's a layer on top of layer on top of a layer for analysis to give you positional risk to know where hedging is, to know where arbitrage is and other things you don't normally use. And they're very simple because these are just three tools, bullish, bullish, bullish. And when they line up, it's great. I bet big. When they don't line up, I bet small news risk management. Hey, Matt, your experience expire next month. Uh, so you can try extended. Um, can you rephrase that? I understand what you said. But basically, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. This intro video just kind of shows you utilizing the tools we have. We have 15 tools. I showed you three of them.